My name is uh, Chris Rose, even, and this is Alex Baker, and we are sent into space. Um, what we do is we make kits so anyone can send their own items into space. And the experiment we're going to be talking about today is particle sampling in the stratosphere, typically around 30 kilometers. So, what do you need in order to do this kind of experiment? Well, you're going to need a big helium balloon. You are going to need a, a payload uh, to house all the equipment in. You're going to need your sample catcher device, which we'll touch upon later, and the GPS tracking unit and a mechanism to activate this sample capture device. And a parachute to bring everything down nice and slowly, because as you can imagine, we don't want this thing just falling out of the sky. So we're going to take a little look at some of the equipment. Um, this is the brains of the operation here. Um, we've got um, a transmitter module, a GPS module that takes position and altitude data. It feeds that into the, the driver mechanism, which is really just a CD drive, well sealed up and cleaned. And that also feeds us position back on the ground so that we can chase it down. There's a radio receiver unit there. And that goes to, we've got an antenna and a laptop that decodes all of the data coming from the payload. So um, effectively, that's it. There's, there's nothing super complicated about it. We need a big helium balloon, which requires quite a lot of gas a hose that will connect up to the, the balloon just for easy handling, uh, a few other little bits and pieces to help it on its way. We have um, a parachute that's connected to our plan B you see there, which is effectively a luggage label with our details on, just in case it all goes horribly wrong. The, uh, the balloon itself is pretty big, as demonstrated by the glamorous assistant. Yeah. Yeah, these things are really quite large. This is a top two kilogram in weight balloon. Um, we, uh, we have to be very delicate with this because we don't want it to touch the ground. This is why I'm trying to sort of keep it aloft until it's able to sort of hold its own weight. And I'm checking here for lots of any per uh, perforations in the balloon because this is really important. It will dramatically change how the balloon ultimately bursts. And we want a very clean burst. We want it to sort of eradicate itself from the situation. And Alex's hands are getting very cold at this point because ex expanding gas is very cold. So the balloon's basically ready to go there. We obviously want to capture some images from while we're up there. I mean, we're going to go up to about 35 kilometers, so it'd be great to see what it looks like up there as well. Um, and we're, we're just ready to go then. So here we go. It's a beautiful North of England day. Really quite low cloud on this day, so it really doesn't take us long to get into that. Um, we've introduced some examples in the top right-hand corner there so you can get an idea of height reference as we go. Yet straight away, within a, the first minute, we're up in the clouds. Um, if we skip along a little bit to around four minutes, we're between layers of the clouds, heading towards the sort of height that you'd find hot air balloons cruising up. So you're probably wondering at this point, like, we've let this balloon go. How do we find this thing again? We do have our tracking systems on board. We have two tracking systems one of which is a cellular based and one of which is a live tracking, which Alex introduced earlier. Again, we've, uh, we're just going to keep skipping forwards through the footage. Within six minutes, you know, we're heading towards 2,000 meters up. It's kind of the height that you'd find geese and swans, and we're above most of the clouds. On this particular day, we've just got layers of cloud all the way up to uh, around 4,000 meters, uh, which we'll again skip onto. You'll start to get an impression of uh, how the payload jerks about throughout the flight, so it's quite bumpy to start with. As we start to reach the jet stream, it will get bumpier still and then really start to settle out as the, the, there is less and less wind there. Within just about 15 minutes, we're higher than any mountain in Europe. So that's uh, Mont Blanc there. Um, and we're about the same sort of height that you'd find light aircraft. You can see a little bit of misting around the camera at this point, uh, which will clear up as the, sort of the, the atmosphere outside drops. It's, it's something we, we sort of uh, we do have to deal with and take steps to make sure that condensation isn't a problem. Again, half an hour in, we're at the height of Everest now, so we are above any point on the Earth's surface. You're probably wondering, um, you know, is it, is it a hazard to planes? Um, realistically, no, but you should be very careful with these things. One of the things we do have to do is to get CA approval and get a notum, which is a notice to airmen. So this goes on to all the, the systems, to anyone who might need to know about it. You can see that there's a sort of contrast beginning to form between a little bit of blackness creeping in in, in the sky as we sort of get above the majority of the atmosphere. We're at... Um, yeah, heading towards 11,000 meters. 11, this is the kind of height that you'd uh, get your commercial aircraft flying at. Um, you'll notice that it's got a lot bumpier. We're just heading through the jet stream here. So the, the 
payload needs to be well secured. Absolutely. We, we do have um, a little item we, we put together and developed. It's called a black box, we call it. And it, 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 um, it has accelerometers on board. And you really can see a dramatic difference in the journey of the payload as it does enter into and leave the jet stream. So this is uh, now we're just reaching the tropopause, it's called. It's the lowest temperature at this stage of the atmosphere. The temperature actually goes down all the way up to here, which is why you get the condensation on the lens. Um, but then the temperature starts climbing again as we get further than this. Um, so yeah, we're now technically in the stratosphere. Although some of these cameras do naturally fish out the footage ever so slightly, um, you are at a height where you can begin to see the sort of curvature of the Earth. And, uh, yeah, we, we start to get a, a, a sort of thin blue line of the atmosphere forming. And certainly you can see the blackness of space developing there. It's a shame it's a particularly cloudy day on this occasion. It's, uh, it's quite nice to see some land mass from this altitude. But this is England after all. So the temperature's probably creeped up a little from, uh, from its lowest point, uh, but it'll still be very cold up there. I anticipate sort of minus 40 at least. Still a little bit of movement in the payload as well. If we just skip on a little bit, we're actually now within an hour at about the height that Concord could reach. So it had uh, an attempt at an altitude record and reached around about 18 kilometers. Um, and we're there within about an hour. These things, um, we, we try and aim for these things to ascend at about five meters per second. This, this is a, a fairly standard for us. Um, and what we can do is augment how much helium we put in put less helium in, we get a slower ascent rate, but it's more susceptible to side winds, so it will travel, travel further across the country. And then skipping on a little bit again, we're at uh, almost 24 kilometers. We're at really the height where you would find spaceship and weather balloons, and that's pretty much it that's man-made. Um, we're also at just about the height we want to start sampling the stratosphere. So in this case, we've programmed it to open at 24 kilometers and close again at 27 kilometers. So uh, just in a second, you'll see the way that the mechanism works. And it is literally the simplest thing that we could think of, just a CD drive. On that CD drive, we have little sticky tabs. So any particles that are around will, uh, that, that come into contact, it will remain there. Uh, when we reach our second altitude that we want the draw to close at, it'll simply close and remain sealed for the rest of the flight. At this point in time, myself and Alex are on the road somewhere with an aerial sticking out the window celebrating because we've got that bit of data back through our strings of, um, strings of data that say, draw opened, that's halfway. So now we, we just want to ensure that it, it understands how high it is, doesn't lose GPS signal, and shuts itself at the correct altitude as well. Because it's very all well and good taking a sample, um, but we need to make sure this sample closes effectively and properly. And you can see it just did it there. So that will then tell us, draw closed, and we're, we're happy. And now we've skipped on to the top of the flight. Um, you can see that there's essentially no wind. There's a little bit of movement of the payload. But the atmosphere looks incredibly thin. We are above 99% in terms of pressure of the atmosphere. Um, I think we just, we'll just let you enjoy the footage for just a couple of minutes, because uh, I know we do. It's worth saying that part of this experiment is uh, we're trying to capture a sample of the stratosphere. There's a current theory that suggests that particles above a certain size can't drift to this kind of altitude because they're, they're just too large to drift up naturally. So if we find particles that are of that kind of size, the, the hypothesis is that they've not come from Earth, they've come from space. And if we find any particles that happen to be organic, or life-based, and they're of a certain size, then either the current theory that says that they can't come from Earth is incorrect, or we've found a, an example of biological life coming from space. You might say people would have to reset their understanding, Alex. You might say you that. Might say right? that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are just approaching the burst point of the balloon, so the pressure has dropped as it's risen, and the balloon is now about 10 meters in diameter, um, and we need to actually begin the descent. You'll remember um, somebody jumping from a balloon 
Felix, Felix Baumgartner, was Felix it? Baumgartner did this, and it was recently repeated by a Google executive. And this is effectively what's going to happen to us. So we're going to accelerate with very little air resistance up to around 200 miles an hour or thereabouts um, once the balloon bursts. Remember we said how it was important that there was no little perforations or weak points in the balloon. Um, you can see that the balloon completely burst. If, if we get any ho uh, initial holes, these will just stretch and vent gas, so it, it can really significantly affect the experiment. And again, at this height, this will just spin out of control. There's no air resistance to slow it down. There's nothing really that will stop it spinning until it gets lower. As it gets lower, the parachute will actually be able to then open out as the, the pressure increases. The parachute will be free to open out and slow the thing down. You can also hear at this point that there's very little sound. There's no real air rushing against the microphone. We actually did an experiment, uh, which you'll be able to see on our website, that uh, we, we played a, a music behind the camera throughout our flight, and you could you know, dram really dramatically see how the, si the sound dropped off throughout the flight to the point where you could, you could hear nothing. Um, and then as it dropped back out, down into the atmosphere, that sound again increased. So there is a little bit of the balloon left. It's come to say hello there but a little bit lower down again. Obviously, we're just cutting through this footage. Uh, we're sort of heading back towards the cloud level now, and it's just blown out the way, so that's nice. So you can see where we are again. Again, back through the, uh, the layers of cloud, you can see the balloon, or what's left of it there. And on the ground, we'd aim to be as close to the landing point as we could be. So we run simulations before we launch these things. And they're normally accurate to within 5 or 10 miles. And these are also important to, for us to ensure we're not going to challenge the sea or any populated areas. If that was the case, then we would move the launch site so that it comes down somewhere more uh, desirable. As you can see, we're in the countryside. Looks like we might... Oh, we, we landed in a tree. <laughs> so... It's not a small tree either. It wasn't a small tree, no. <laughs> and this is why we carry climbing equipment around with us from now on. Alex had to climb this tree, actually. Fortunately, he is a climber. So now it's the point where we, we sort of review our footage uh, under a scanning electron microscope. And we can see that we, we, we did get some very interesting results. This on the left is cosmic dust. This is non-organic. But we can see the scale of it is sufficient that it, it could not have come from, up, um, from down under the current understanding. We also found some examples with biological life, which was EDAX, which is like an elemental analysis, which, um, which is very interesting, along with some evidence of impact, uh, which suggests they came in quite quick. This was one of the more dramatic findings. This is a, a diatom, which is an example of biological life, quite comparable to uh, plankton. plankton. And, um, and so this got quite a bit of media attention. Uh, we repeat this experiment a lot, and we would uh, you know, encourage others to, to get involved with this kind of thing. And um, so as we, as we sort of stressed earlier, um, these things, as we understand it, have come from up rather than down. We just present the scientific findings. Um, which, which go again against the current theory, really. Uh, we are sent into space. Thank you. Thank you very much.